there, everybody. Um, I mentioned before how I think the nature of work and stuff is going to change in the age of AI. Um, kind of talking about it a little bit. Uh, what I said before is that, well, in the future, and by the future I mean like 2024, not too far away, uh, what people will do is um, you won't just have one AI that you pay for, but you'll make your own. Uh, and you'll have teams of AI who are smarter than humans do projects for yourself. Uh, I thought I would just make one just so you could see how easy it is and kind of like what your life will be like. Uh, the, you'll probably have to pay for a service like five or 10 bucks a month, right? But let's say, all right, oh, I wanna create my own AI, <clears throat> right? Companies will have little builders they could do it. Let's see what I want to make. Remember Jared Diamond? Computer code will be whatever you could type in, right? So you don't need to know computer code. You just need to know how to describe anything, right? Describing anything, you'll create your own AI. Um, so let's see, this is on the process of making it. Let's say normally this takes like a couple seconds. A couple seconds. Um, let's see. And there are people who are already creating basically like swarms of AI. Um, people are often, what they're doing is they're basing their AIs on like maybe a corporate structure. So if you owned your own business, you'd make a marketing person and a this person and a that person. And this will be plugged into like your email or anything you wanted to be plugged into. Um, let's see. that image that much. <clears throat> um, and these will be, all the different things you tell it to do is what it will do. So if you tell it, you're gonna be my email assistant, check my emails, if they're emails from these people, respond to them in this way, keep track of it. Ah, uh, well, that's a bit better. People are also making copies of themselves. And so what they're doing is, uh, well, I have an academic friend who has published a lot. So he copied everything he published, put it into a context window. Um, I would say the, the context window, right, that's this little window that you type in your information of what you want it to do. It's had a limit of like 100 words, 200 words, then it got up to 1,000 words. The most recent update is, a hundred thousand words, a hundred thousand words, right? And that's now. Probably in 2024, probably be a million words, which means your programming for whatever you're making uh, can be as complicated as that many words, right? So your instructions and instructions and instructions on top of instructions, you could tell it, tell it to do different levels of things. Let's see what else does it want me to do. Any topics to avoid? Hmm.
Uh, and when people, uh, some people are loading up their own journals, right, their, their diaries and stuff, so that uh, it gets a real good sense of who you are, and then it can respond to emails and other people in your voice if that's what you want. As you can see, you could put in all kinds of information about how you wanted to interact, what you wanted to do, uh, and it's it's building this, right? And this service that I pay for, uh, it's like 20 bucks a month. It's not a huge amount, but like I said, there are actually free versions of this out there uh, because Meta, AKA Facebook, uh, just put theirs out as open source so people can do whatever they want with it. Uh, let's see here. All right, ask me if I want to try it out, right? So this is what it's, what it's making here. And when I'm finished, you know, I can make it so only I can use it or only people that I send a link, or I can make it public, right? What does that mean? Well, people know about uh, like an app store, right? Uh, and before 2007 and Apple coming out with the Apple app store, uh, before that, there, there wasn't really that type of function uh, that kind of revolutionized things. Well, there's gonna be new AI stores where people will make these and you can buy them. Uh, so plenty will be free, but that may take a little bit of time. So let's see, what, I, what, I, what, what would I say to Jared Diamond, the artificial intelligence? I would say, uh, ask him if he's an environmental determinist. Oh, it's not responding in its voice that well. And then when you interact with these things, you're training it, right? So if I feel like it didn't respond in his voice, right, as I go through, I can make updates and stuff. Um, and like I said, this will be 2024, right? These will just be all over. So when I say kind of like upgrade your ambitions, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, all right, seeing some eyes glaze over, so I'm gonna move on to our lecture stuff. Any questions about any of this stuff? Eventually this stuff will be integrated into classwork and whatnot, although actually a, a lot of people are kind of dragging their feet. All right, uh, we're, we're moving on to our chapters on cities. Um, oh, one thing I should say, so, if I only got caught up on grading the weekly stuff we do in class, so if you lost some points and you feel like you weren't absent, you can let me know, because sometimes the names are a bit hard to read, and I'll take your word for it, uh, give you those points back. Uh, but a reminder, if you missed some days or whatnot, uh, we are going to have some extra credit at the end of the semester, so you'll be able to make up like a, a week and a half or so of, of points uh, if you did miss any. I would say in general this class actually has uh, good attendance compared to my other class. All right, um, <clears throat> growth of cities, right? Well, speaking of Jared Diamond, Gundrens and Steel talked a lot about the first civilizations, which was the first urbanization. Uh, what we know about these first cities is, is kind of has its ups and downs because there's lots of areas of the world uh, where you had early development, uh, but the wear and tear of their environments have made it so it's uh, less easy to kind of figure that out, right? And there's been great wars. Uh, if, if some of these early urban systems, you know, we're talking like 10,000 years ago, if they're made out of mostly wood, um, they, they often have decayed through time. Uh, some of them uh, last a long time, especially if they're in a dry climate. That's part of the reason why we know so much about Egyptians, right? It's like, well, there's plenty of stuff that's out in the desert. A lot of it was buried in sand uh, for thousands of years. Uh, because the dunes move around in the deserts of the world. Uh, but plenty of other places, like in the tropics, um, there's barely any kind of hint 
Uh, and as you, well, as you read through this chapter, you saw that uh, with the recent upgrades of scanning technology, including artificial intelligence, we're able, getting increasingly able to kind of piece through. Uh, people are finding like an old brick, breaking it open, and then, well, you could do DNA analysis of, of what's in the brick, and actually, sometimes they have found the, the DNA of, of who did that, right? And these are solving lots of old mysteries, uh, but the, the, the research continues. Uh, it's always a bit of a moving target. Uh, so just some definitions, urbanization, growth and development of dense concentrations of people into settlements, uh, urban area, city and surrounding suburbs. Uh, so suburbs have that herb, uh, those are also urban areas. 57% uh, of the world's population lives in urban areas and urbanization around the world is increasing, is increasing. Uh, I mentioned this in the, the previous chapters on agriculture, but in general, people are moving out of agriculture. People are moving from rural areas to urban areas. Um, and so cities themselves, even in a country where their population might just be uh, not growing, the cities are growing because of movement, so people moving to the cities. Uh, metropolitan area, city, and the surrounding areas that are influenced economically and culturally by the city. <clears throat> Some fair definitions there. I don't have any reflection. Um, Site and situation, uh, well, often historically along trade routes, right? Usually urbanization will happen in places that have lots of resources. Um, our book talks about urbanization in the US being along the fall line. Uh, and I don't know if it really describes what a fall line is very much. Uh, people know what a fall line of a river is? Uh, do people know why, why the Twin Cities are where they are? No, not at all? Well, all right. So you know what a river is, right? You know what a river is? Moving water. Um, well, usually at some point, uh, as you see, we've got a lot of rivers coming through here. Uh, well, Again, using, using the Twin Cities as an example, one of the big reasons why Minneapolis and St. Paul exist where they are is because we're on a river. Not only that, but we have St. Anthony Falls, St. Anthony Falls, where water is falling, and that falling water is energy. And in the early days before uh, we started using fossil fuels, uh, before we started using plenty of, of different stuff, that moving water was a source of energy. Uh, and in fact, many of the small lakes and streams in our state used to have little, uh, well, little mills. Uh, and so development was a bit spread out, but when it's along a major river and that's a large amount of water moving, uh, that has led to the growth of a lot of urbanization, especially as our economies moved away from agriculture and more into industrialization, right? Uh, manufacturing things, need large sources of power. Uh, well, similar falls to when we talk about St. Anthony Falls, uh, are along these major rivers and what's happening is you have some underlying rock that is being eroded away. Well, at least it was eroded. Uh, St. Anthony Falls uh, had been moving through time because, well, that fall, the water going over it slowly erodes away at that rock face, moving it back. It would have continued to move back, but as places urbanize, they did what we do, which is you put up a whole bunch of concrete and infrastructure around it so that it's not eroding and moving because you don't really want your major source of power to just be moving around, right? You want it where you're going to utilize it. <clears throat> right, the St. Anthony Falls, uh, 1855, uh, this is very much not how it looks anymore, right? Uh, discussion. Um, transportation networks, you know, uh, there was a time that most things were transported via water. It's a relatively cheap and effective way to transport. Um, but as places developed and as our transportation technology changed through time, uh, this changed, right? So development in Minnesota, a lot of it was just along the river and along small streams and rivers, but there's lots of 
the state of Minnesota, as well as lots of places in the world uh, that are not quite accessible that way, uh, rail lines went, right? The, the age of, of trains, uh, not that we don't still have trains, uh, but transportation has changed quite a bit uh, and things have, as far as transportation goes, although the trains are still a very cheap and efficient way of transporting things, we've changed a lot to uh, trucking, especially for, for large, large amounts of stuff and then you know cars for individual people and so our urbanization has changed as these types of modes of transportation have changed <clears throat> oh, i kind of mentioned this stuff i didn't mention uh well recent growth recent growth uh growth being much more high tech these days right uh so it's tended to more recent growth has been around high-tech areas. Uh, these new trends are often at the cost of past trends, right? So for example, well, the US has a lot of manufacturing, but it used to be kind of a, a worldwide powerhouse when it comes to uh, factories, right? Um, well, there was a deindustrialization phase that we went through where many, uh, of the factory jobs were automated uh, and they were outsourced to other countries, right? Um, and so, well, when that happened, a lot of areas that were industrial, uh, well, they, they fell, right? They, their economies really sunk and it really depends on the place. Uh, the book talks about Detroit as an example because uh, Detroit, well, if you have a, if you, if your whole economy revolves around kind of like one product that your urban space is making and in Detroit it was automobiles. Well, during the heyday of, of early automobile production, Detroit was a giant city, right? And people were moving to it, lots of jobs, lots of economic growth. Um, but then through time, there was competition from imports. And then, like I said, a lot of, uh, well, robots replaced a lot of workers in industry. And so what happened? Well. A lot of those places had their ec economies really negatively affected. Uh, the Twin Cities here, well, we had a bit more of a diverse economy. Uh, we did make cars here. There was like a, a Ford assembly plant. plant. Uh, we have uh, 3M manufacturing. It's still located here, but less of its manufacturing is here. Um, in lots of cities, if they've been able to pivot, so for example, Twin Cities, we have a number of different uh, high-tech centers. Uh, Biotechnology is actually a big cluster industry here. Uh, plus we have excellent schools and that is usually kind of the hotbed of innovation. And so more recently places that are, are have these attributes tend to have done better. Uh, so Twin Cities compared to say Detroit um, or actually the whole, uh, the whole kind of Eastern, northeastern uh, U.S. used to be our big manufacturing center. That whole area has been in a bit of an economic decline, all right? Like big states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, that used to be kind of the big important states. Uh, they still have most of that population and whatnot, but they're less of the kind of high-tech cluster that is driving growth these days. <clears throat> a book refers to a lot of these different cities as legacy cities. Um, what many of them have attempted to do, like I said, they've attempted to pivot. Uh, I would say Europe has done this the best where you could have a city that used to be an industrial powerhouse and they'll say, okay, uh, our industry has left, let's change to something else. Can we go make this tourism, right? And what they have done, uh, Twin Cities did this as well, is they said, well, how about if we see that river that started our development and has been basically an industrial site, right? Usually lots of uh, just industrial waste and uh, old abandoned factories and stuff all around the rivers. Uh, Twin Cities said, well, what if we redevelop that area, right? What if we turn some of that area into parks so people can just like relax by the river? And what if we see the river as an amenity, as something that's nice, rather than just a way to transport a whole bunch of manufactured stuff. And uh, well, it took a long time to do that pivot, to do that changeover. And a lot of places have tried it and they have not really been able to successfully do that. 
like I said, Detroit being one of the classic examples. Uh, the Twin Cities, though, we have lots of development that are around the river, lots of new development, and we cleaned up a lot of it because it used to, well, if you just picture an industrial wasteland, that, that used to be what the river looked like. And now it's been cleaned up, and now we have big theaters and whatnot that are right around the river, and we've made it into an amenity. Uh. <clears throat> so as, developed, as development happened and urbanization happened, as the changes of transportation technology happened, um, so as everyone got cars, right, we started sprawling out, right, suburbanization, uh, and well, it's cheaper for a developer in general to develop out in a green area and in, in, you know a place that maybe used to be a farm or something compared to redeveloping something within the city that you know maybe was an industrial site has like who knows what kind of pollutants the only way in the Twin Cities we are able to redevelop those areas is usually the cities uh, offered to spend money on it so for example the cities would make a deal where they would do the environmental cleanup uh, or they would do the removal of buildings and different things to try to make it more like it's just an empty site that could be developed. Um, but that takes a lot of money, uh, and our economy was a bit more well-rounded. Plenty of places don't have that option. They don't have that much money to do that kind of a thing. Um, and so the amount of sprawl of a city is usually an indication of when its growth happened, right? And so what I mean by that is uh, well, for a long time we had just what was called the walking city. Uh, that was the term that is used for when most people got around on their feet, right? Um, in general, people uh, like to get to their destination in about a half hour, whether it's walking or actually driving. That's as long as people kind of want to focus on getting around. Uh, well, that has changed a lot through time when everyone was walking. again. You, keep with the example of the Twin Cities, well, everyone wanted to live basically near downtown, right? Because everyone was working downtown. You don't want to walk all day. Uh, but also, like, when you, where would you shop? Where would you get groceries? Well, you don't want to walk too far either. And so everything was really clustered in central cities. As a transportation technology took off through time, uh, we developed, you know, carriages and horses. Uh, but what really fueled the first suburban sprawl was the trolley system, right? Twin Cities had a very intricate trolley system that went out to the suburbs. Uh, and the development is, has been called uh, finger, finger light development because those transportation networks would be done in, in kind of like fingers that would go out and you'd have development along them, right? But not a lot in the big in-between areas. That's what we had here. Um, well, as more and more people got cars, right? And as more and more areas then were paved, all of a sudden, uh, people started moving further and further out uh, to the point that it actually hurt the economic vitality of the central cities because the central cities used to be, well, that's where you bought everything. That's where it was cheapest. You worked there, uh, you shopped there, uh, and if you could, that's where you, you slept, you know? Um, well, everyone sprawled out, and so shopping and everything else went, moved with them. Uh, and so then we have the development of things called edge cities um, Edge City, that's a term that was developed by uh, a guy named uh, Jerol Garou. Uh, he's mentioned specifically in our, in our book. Uh, when he came up with that term, one of the cities that he was studying was actually uh, the Bloomington-Burnsville area, right? That is a good example of an Edge City, right? An Edge City is basically a suburb that becomes so big that they economically uh, are, are kind of fighting with the big central cities that used to be where everything was. Uh, and so, well, Mall of America is a great example, right? It's like, well, if people want to go to a great big place to shop, do they go downtown? They used to, uh, but not really so much anymore. There is some shopping downtown, but hardly any compared to how it used to be, right? Um, no, people will just go out to the Mall of America, pretty easy parking. Uh, most of the things that you would want to buy. Bloomberg, another term from this chapter, suburb that has grown rapidly in a large and sprawling city with more than 100,000 residents. Uh, plenty of those have happened through time. 
The book has a number of different maps showing development of different cities. Uh, part of the reason LA um, is, is such a, a sprawly place, there's a couple of different reasons. First, the, the economic uh, start of, of California uh, was very much diffused, meaning like there was a gold rush. But the gold wasn't all just like downtown. The gold was like a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. So you had lots of little developments happen. Uh, also, the oil industry was a big industry in early California. And again, that's also a, a resource that doesn't just locate downtown. It's a little bit over here, a little bit over there. Uh, and uh, most of California's growth happened after we had basically transitioned to the automobile. Uh, so that's why. Yeah, well, if you ever go to LA and you're trying to like get anywhere, it's like, well, you gotta just drive for what feels like forever just to go to anywhere, right? Very sprawling. <clears throat> A couple more terms, excerpt, fast growing community outside of, or on the edge of a metropolitan area where the residents and community are loosely connected to the central city and suburbs. Exurbs, usually when people use the term exurb, they're, they're usually talking about the wealthier suburbs. Uh, very often these suburbs, because they have a little bit more money, they have a little bit more space for like parks, their lots are a lot bigger, things like that. Uh, so some of our kind of far out suburbs could qualify in this way. Uh, wildland, wildland urban interface, uh, another term for this chapter, what does it mean? Well. Um, as sprawl happens, uh, things have been happening such as, well, I mean, forest fires are just kind of a natural process, a thing that happens in forests. But if you've had sprawl that kind of has developed right into the middle of a forest, uh, well, then, uh, you know, these, these suburbs uh, can get burnt up. I would say this happens a lot in California because any place that has a good dry season. Um, but what happens is development even though it's in California, which is a drier climate, when they have sprawled and suburbanized, people tend to still want, they want some trees, they want some grass, they want some bushes. Uh, and what they're basically doing is they're creating uh, stuff to, 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 that can catch on fire easily if there's any kind of a drought, right? And so these fires have kind of turned into uh, great big problems. Infill. Redevelopment that identifies and develops vacant parcels of land within previously built areas. What does that mean? Like I said, the areas that used to be industrial, uh, all kinds of things that if, if something went out of business, if something isn't used anymore, these old industrial spaces especially, uh, the companies would just be like bankrupt in the far past. All the people who would have uh, known kind of what happened on that property could be long dead. And so no one knows like what kind of pollutants are there, what's going on. And so these developments, well, they're prioritized by planners who want less sprawl, uh, but they cost more. So usually, like I said, the cities uh, will offer some extra money for developers to develop in those areas. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna show you the Twin Cities going through these phases of development so you kind of have a better sense of of kind of how that goes. <clears throat> as I said, St. Anthony Falls, this one is uh, about a decade past the other photo. Uh, the falls themselves, uh, like I said, they're eroding and moving, moving back. And in fact, there was at one point where there was a big cave-in in the river, completely shifted course. Uh, quite a few people were killed in this, but this is like 150 years ago. Um, it was after that that we then put in all the infrastructure around it to, to make it so that this river would not be moving around, right? It goes exactly where we want it to go, so we had that source of power. <clears throat> um, a lot of the first migration into Minnesota, uh, well, it was along that river, and then after that it was along train routes. <clears throat> this is like an old ad for moving to Minnesota. Um, Paddlewheel steamboats. You could still ride on these today. People sometimes get married on them and have parties. Anyone ever been on one of these Paddleford boats? Yeah. What kind of, what were you there for? I think it was Mississippi. It was just going down Mississippi. Going down Mississippi? Yeah. Was it like a party or anything? No. Oh. All right, anybody else? Yeah, it was like a wedding rehearsal. Yeah, I would say they're popular with weddings. Um, 
I have been uh, to a murder mystery on one of these. Theaters will use them and, and they'll do historical dramas and stuff. Um, yeah, but these are still around, uh, still in service. Um, also, as I mentioned, the, the stagecoach, right, being carried around by a horse was an early mode of transportation that was, well, it's better than walking. Um, the omnibus here, the, actually in a, a bit of state of decay. Uh, and then through time, right, the automobile. Um, early streetcar suburbs. Well, this one is actually on electric. Um, you probably don't know this, but we had a very expensive trolley system that was all uh, electric. Um, before that, it had been, well, they'd been pulled by horses. Uh, but, well, that could be very messy. That could be very messy, right? It was a lot of problems, right? The horses, well, they got to stop and eat and drink and stuff. Uh, and they kind of leave messes everywhere. Uh, I would say also a big problem that isn't mentioned a lot in history books is the fact that, well, I mean, they die. Uh, and so what would happen is, you know, you'd have your horse that's pulling your vehicle die, uh, and people would just leave it on the side of the road to rot. And so there'd be, in Chicago, there was stories in the newspaper of, like, thousands of horse bodies on the streets, because there wasn't, like, any kind of removal service. Well, switching to electric uh, was much better, plus, because we had all that water energy, we had a very large electrical grid. <clears throat> Uh, this is 1889, 1889. The trolleys were a bit small at first. <clears throat> Minneapolis, 1862, very different than today, obviously. Uh, this is Minneapolis, Washington Avenue, 1903. This is after we industrialized, right? Uh, and so downtown, right now there's like a light rail line that goes through here, but this used to be all, all trains, right? Uh, and the buildings behind that are on the river, uh, the warehouse district as it's called, those were actual warehouses because, well, we didn't have just-in-time production where you can go online and, and make sure all of your parts are going to be together at the same place. So we had lots of space to store parts for things that we would make, right? So if we made anything, a car or whatever else, we'd have large amounts of storage for the parts of it. Um, and they would be as close to possible as transportation, right, to make it cheaper. This area, as part of kind of the legacy city pivot, we've turn, turned these into condos, right? Or at least a lot of them. Uh, and so now this is a big condo area. Uh, and you may ask, you know, well, why were they ch changed into condos? Well, there's been a lot of different theories about urban development through time. And for a while, there was the feeling that, well, as, as manufacturing left, right, and there was a bit of a vacuum in the city and people were moving out, uh, some felt that if we made more commercial space, then uh, businesses would locate and that would bring people back to the city. Other competing interests said, well, if we just make places for people to live, then people will live in the city and they'll wanna shop and do their stuff within the city. Uh, like I said, these were competing voices, and they both kind of won. There was a, a fair amount of commercial that was built, a fair amount of housing. Through time, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the commercial didn't do great, but the actual housing did quite well. Um, I would say post-pandemic, our, our central cities are having a similar, similar problem where uh, corporate headquarters and whatnot uh, in-person work is only back to something like 63%, right? So still a lot less. Uh, this again showing uh, the mill district, right? Uh, our, our early state's growth was very agricultural uh, and the milling originally had been for milling grain into flour, right? Uh, that's part of the reason why we have a lot of those types of businesses still here today, right? Pillsbury. Uh, these companies that make baked goods, uh, many of them are still located here. This train here, this is actually a commuter train, and this was going out to what were some of the first suburbs in the Twin Cities. These are areas that we don't even really think of as suburbs anymore. This is going to Dinkytown. <clears throat> People know Dinkytown, been there. Um, you know, college students like to go over there and hang out, cool stores and stuff. Well, that was a one of the first suburbs, and I know we don't think of it as a suburb now. Uh, and also, uh, 
all, all these areas that were around downtown, they were their own cities for a long time. Uh, but Minneapolis annexed them. As people sprawled out, right, as these commuter commuters who were coming into work in the city and then going out to Dinky Town uh, where they would own a home, as their tax base moved out, the cities would annex those areas so that they would keep the tax base. They basically did that until the suburbs got wealthy enough that they just basically said no. That's another reason why if you look at some cities like New York being a much older city, uh, it's really big because they kept on annexing places and annexing places, uh, but they are an older city and so that process happened earlier. Or a city like LA, uh, LA itself is actually pretty small uh, because the suburbs around it did not allow LA to annex them and take them over. Uh, here it's a bit of a mix where there's a lot of annexation and so Minneapolis and St. Paul are actually pretty big, uh, but the suburbs did eventually basically say no to that. They wanted to keep their own tax base. The reason this is kind of in color from 1910 is this was actually a postcard that people could buy uh, where they would basically send this to, to family and they would say, oh, I'm doing great in Minneapolis. Look at our fancy skyscrapers and stuff, right? Uh, and I know we wouldn't consider these skyscrapers, I think, anymore, probably, if something is like 10 stories, right? It's like, oh, is that a skyscraper? Uh, you can also see in this picture, well, there used to be a lot more pollution, right? There used to be a lot more pollution. Uh, a lot of, uh, as industry increased, it wasn't just the water that was used as power, but fossil fuels, right? And so coal started being shipped in. Still is today. A lot of power is generated by coal here. Uh, but it's not as polluting. Uh, they didn't really have any environmental laws and regulations to the point that a lot of the downtown buildings, the older ones, uh, if they have like a dark black or brown color to them, often that's just uh, coal smoke that went along them for many decades. Some of, sometimes they paint over, sometimes they scrub it off. This is that commuter rail line that I was mentioning. You can kind of see the windows. <clears throat> um, when we talk about other places in the early industrialization and growth, we talk about shanty towns and things like this, right? Because you have rural populations who are losing jobs and losing work, and so they're moving to the central cities. Uh, well, there was a lot of those types of places here as well, right? Where people would go to land that they didn't own, and they would attempt to put together some housing for themselves. Uh, and this, this one here along the river, uh, well, it was along the river because this area flooded a lot. In fact, it's flooded in this photo. That's the reason they took a photo. Historically, they never really took a lot of photos of poor areas. Just wasn't a thing people did. Photography was expensive. So you had rich people taking pictures of rich people stuff, but you didn't really have pictures of urban slums. But we used to have those uh, that were exactly the same way as, as shanty towns in the rest of the world now. Uh, I, I think the main difference is ours have little chimneys because, of course, you need, you need more heat here than in much of the areas we're studying where urbanization is happening. <clears throat> um, but there would be entire little villages of these shanty towns just rural populations trying to live next to the city, right? And I would say these days, in some of the same areas, we have tent cities, right? If you're driving around and you see a bunch of tents here or there. <clears throat> as I mentioned, the trolley system, as it became more elaborate and got bigger, more and more people were using it, uh, the prices for the trolleys was really cheap because the people who owned the trolley companies they made their money on, uh, if they said where they wanted a trolley line to go through, the government would give them that land and then they could resell it because all of a sudden it's very valuable if there's a trolley going by it, uh, especially if two trolleys crossed, right? And so that money that was being made from development is what they did to keep the trolley, uh, well, it would be like only a couple cents to ride the trolley all day. And the other thing that that did was that actually, in the Twin Cities, um, well, other areas as well, it, it allowed people to kind of get to know their city, right? Where it used to be, people might not leave their neighborhood and whatnot. Uh, well, with, with early and easy, cheap transportation, all of a sudden people started meeting new people and getting around more and getting more of a sense of our cities as places. 
uh, whereas they had been basically a bunch of different ethnic communities, right? Where you'd have different immigrant groups who did not really mix that much. Uh, but transportation made it so that all of a sudden everyone started mixing more. Uh, Minneapolis development stages, Fauché Tower. Um, people ever been near the Fauché Tower? Ever been there? Been in there? Um, well, at the time, 1929, uh, that was right before the stock market crash and the Great Depression started. This was one of the big economic uh, uh, investments that, that happened locally. The guy, uh, well, he lost all of his money on the stock market right after building it. So that was the tallest building here locally for many years, for many years. And now you can hardly see it because the other buildings are all so big. The reason why it has this weird kind of apron around it is because at the time it was considered to be so tall that the city felt that it would eventually collapse. And so they felt that instead of having it on a corner where if it collapsed it could really damage these properties, they'd have it in the center so that when it eventually collapsed it wouldn't damage other people's uh, buildings. Of course it has not collapsed. This is not an impossibly high building as we came to find out much later. Uh, 1920s, right, we see the slow transition to, to cars, to automobiles. Um, this is uh, the light system, right, that we take for granted, our, our street lights. They used to have someone in those that would change them. It would be manually changed, and I would say when I travel, I see that kind of thing in other countries where you still have a person who will, like, be changing the light signal. <coughs> Um, central cities, especially after everyone started having automobiles, got really clustered. Uh, really, really just too density, too much density. That's part of the reason why there was deconcentration, as, as they call it, where people started moving out, because uh, it would just take forever. The streets would be teeming with people. <clears throat> So before Ford, Henry Ford uh, created the Model T. Now he didn't like invent cars or anything. Uh, cars had before him had been kind of like individual things and they were like kind of little projects that people tinkered around with. A lot of the early car technology actually was developed in France, uh, which is one of the reasons why a lot of uh, terms that involved cars uh, are French terms that we've kind of forgotten that they're French, right? A chassis is a French word. A garage, that's a French word. Chauffeur is a French word. Like all these terms that we're like, oh. Um, what did Ford do? Why did he matter? Uh, well, he created the modern assembly line. Well, it was considered a revolutionary step, not just in the manufacture of automobiles, but in manufacturing in general. Manufacturing in general. Uh, so what did he do that was so smart? Well. I don't know if it was that smart, but growing up, uh, he worked in the meat industry, meat industry, right? Cutting up meat, you know, a butcher, basically. And well, what they did where he worked was, I don't know if anyone has ever worked as a butcher. You take, you know, a cow uh, who is dead, put it up on a big hook, and that hook is on a slider. And what you would do is you'd slide it down and you'd have someone who's an expert on some type of cut of meat, right? And they'd be like, oh, I'm an expert on this part and cut that off, they package it. And then what that person all does all day is they're an expert on that part, right? And then you move it down and you basically, you, you do this until it's just a carcass at the end, right? Well, his idea was what if we were reversed that in a way? What if we took the body of a car, right? Just the, the frame and rolled it down, and you'd have someone who's an expert on steering wheels, right? And you put in the steering wheel. Move it down, you have someone who's an expert on tires. It's like, okay, you're gonna put on tires, and you roll it down, and that way, <clears throat> well, you've all, you've all become parts of a larger machine, right? You all are doing assembly, all these, these little, little movements. This type of work for workers was really difficult. Uh, if you could imagine working on a factory floor and maybe just doing rivets in one hole all day and that's all you're doing, uh, a lot of people didn't want to do that. A lot of people didn't want to do that. So early manufacturing actually had to pay a bit more than other jobs to try to get people to do it because it's a very unnatural way to labor, really. Um, 
but it was very productive. And so that made it so that the automobile that had been a bit of a curiosity was then mass produced, right? Um, today, the, the metaphor would be AI, right? Where it was different people kind of experimenting, trying out little models, and you have a couple models here and there. Well, next year, there will be literally millions of AI. There'll be millions, uh, just mass produced. <clears throat> Some historical photos, again, still from the, the Twin Cities, showing the development of cars through time a little bit. Oh, I would say also, mixed with the growth of automobile and cars and driving around came all these different things that are connected to driving that now we just kind of culturally take for granted, right? So it's when we switch from, are you going to a hotel or a motel? You know, you probably don't think to yourself that, is there a difference? Well, a motel was a motor hotel, which is you drive to it and you park in front of your unit, right? And now that's kind of what, what most hotels are basically like. Um, <clears throat> trailer parks and mobile homes, those came about because of the automobile age. Um, this is a, an example of housing, uh, post-Second World, World War housing. Uh, when the soldiers came back from the war, there wasn't enough housing for people, so temporary housing was put up, uh, including trailer parks. Trailer park, early trailer parks were to, to help out with the housing problem. <clears throat> a lot of the areas that are suburbs locally today uh, they were uh, just country clubs that were in natural areas where kind of the wealthier, well-to-do people would go out there on their weekends. But this is where a lot of norms of suburbanization came into play and came to be accepted, having kind of sprawling development, having this kind of layout and whatnot. Uh, the people who would vacation here, they're like, what if my home was more like that? Uh, and so that very much influenced early suburbanization. Town and Country Club, 1905. <clears throat> um, and I think Town and Country, Town and Country is still a chain of like places to stay. Another Country Club. <clears throat> um, and this is what came later, right? Suburban sprawl, the classic example of suburban sprawl that people use uh, with a lot of. I would say what we call the inner ring suburbs are very like this. Uh, the, the first suburbs like Crystal, Robbinsdale, and New Hope, the first ones. Uh, those ones also have been, uh, well, they've been uh, kind of in a state of decay and it's the outer ring suburbs that are now more popular that people want to move to. <clears throat> um, the early suburbs, standardization of these housing types came into play uh, and in fact people would would, you know, on the back of a magazine, you would have a layout for these houses and, and an ad saying mail to them and they'll give you the full kit to make your own house. Um, before this, you would often have three generations of people all living together, if you can imagine. Uh, and so you would have, well, I use my family as an example. My mother was married with kids at 15. Uh, she did not live on her own. She lived with her parents, but also with her kids and her husband. That was not unusual. Uh, but through this suburbanization process, people spread out. More housing meant that people themselves also spread out. So you'd have more of the nuclear family, as they say, in a house. Uh, a lot of these suburbs, uh, well, they had racial covenants. Uh, many of them, not only did you have to be white to be able to move into them, but you had to be WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, and wealthy, right? Uh, the first ones, anyway. Uh, it wasn't until many years later that, that uh, the Supreme Court decided that that, that was a, a racist law. Uh, I'll show you a documentary about that probably next week. Um, along with sprawl, like I said, shopping changed from downtown. Uh, this is one of the first of this type of development. Uh, I don't know if people recognize at all where this is or what this is. Uh, people have been to Southdale. Southdale, yeah. Um, Southdale was 
one of the, the world's first enclosed malls, right? It's like, oh, well, how did Minnesota be one of the first to come up with these? And it's like, well, it's because our weather's terrible. So of course we did, of course we did. Um, we're also the first place to come up with skyways, right? Because it's like, well, it's terrible outside, right? Minnesotans said, can we make it so that we don't even have to go outside just to change buildings? Yeah. Um, and a lot of these old malls have actually been demolished. There was a Apache Mall that was out in uh, the Columbia Heights area that was one of the very first malls. Uh, and uh, people argued that it should have been preserved for historic value, but you know, it was just demolished. Southdale is still there, although you know Southdale is just doing okay because then through time it got competition from larger malls that were further out. Uh, like I said, trailer, trailer parks. Uh, even uh, well, going out to eat in restaurants, all of a sudden it was very connected to the car. I don't know if people can tell what this is an early version of as far as driving and getting food. This is an early McDonald's, early McDonald's, right? Before they got their kind of classic look. All right, um, a couple more terms from this chapter. I think that's all the local history I'll be, I'll be going over. Um, rank size rural and primate city. Uh, what do these things mean? Typically, you don't have a giant large city right next to another one, right? The Twin Cities are, are an unusual phenomena, but they're not giant cities. They're not the size of New York, right? Um, so what this means, rank size rule, in a nutshell, if you're gonna have a, a city that's next to another, traditionally, it's been quite a bit smaller, and then more distance uh, equals even smaller. This rank size rule, as places have developed, have really kind of changed up. Uh, primate city, this is another thing that has changed through time. A city that far exceeds in population size and influence the country's next largest city. I would say in most of the world, most countries have a primate city where you have uh, one big city and that's it, right? That's also part of the reason why urbanization is happening so fast uh, is because if in a country you have one main city, and everyone in rural areas are losing income and they want to move to a city, that means everybody moves to that one city. Uh, we had something like that in our early development where New York City was our main city, uh, but we're also a big country, and so we've developed, you know, if you ask someone, well, what's, what's the, the main city in, in the U.S., right? You'd have people with different opinions. You'd have some say, oh, New York is the main city. Other people would say, oh, L.A. is the main city. Yet other people might say, Washington DC, right? Someone might say, well, actually the high tech cluster is over in San Francisco, right? You would have multiple, Chicago's a huge city. You'd have multiple, multiple things. Okay, let's pull. Central place theory that is connected to this in that historically, um, you'll have a, a big city, right? And usually right next to it, you'll have smaller cities, but you won't have a larger city, right? You need to have a certain range uh, for uh, a development to be able to sustain this many people. Uh, and so usually they're at a good distance apart from each other, right? That's central place theory in a nutshell. <clears throat> cities across the world. Meta city in uh, mega city and meta city, mega city, city with a population more than 10 million people. Um, as you can see from this map, the rise of mega cities has really changed through time. Uh, early versions of this map, like, did not have these areas for a long time. This is all a relatively recent thing that the main new mega cities are mostly, well, since every place is urbanizing, it would make sense, well, this is where most of the population is, if you remember from our chapters on population. So that's where people have moved to. <clears throat> uh, world cities and their different aspects of their economy. In, in a nutshell, when we look at global cities and world cities and their ranking and deciding if a city qualifies as being a world or global city, usually what they do is uh, geographers will research, for example, how many companies have their main office in that city, right? 
city like London, a lot of companies want to have their main offices in London. Uh, London is very financially interconnected and has been for a couple hundred years. Um, although obviously, right, it's like, well, that doesn't mean all headquarters are located there. There are lo headquarters located here, uh, but it's not really a place that people are fighting over as much. We'll put it that way, right? That's, that's very much in a nutshell. <clears throat> Um, I think the main point here is the, the status and world city hierarchy can change. Uh, if places do not stay dynamic, um, this is in this picture, if memory serves, is from Liverpool. Liverpool uh, in Britain used to be a big manufacturing hub, right? And actually when those manufacturing jobs went away, people were really unsure what the future of Liverpool was going to be. Plenty of towns like Detroit have fallen and not ever been able to come back. Liverpool, uh, well, the government is very active in development in Europe in general, and so Liverpool got a lot of money to redevelop, and so an area that had been all industrial and a riverfront that used to be kind of like an industrial wasteland, they developed it into an amenity, right? And they changed it into a place that people would want to live, people want to want to hang out, people would want to go, uh, and, and enjoy themselves, right? Uh, but again, that takes money. Um, you know, if you're a worldwide tourist, you know, there's lots of cities in Europe that have done this, right? And so tourism is really big in Europe overall. Plenty of areas around the world don't have that money. And if a city used to be industrial and has gone into decline because of automation uh, or other reasons, uh, often they'll, they just decline and that, that's it. <clears throat> Um, the end of this chapter talks a bit about, well, about the ideal city uh, and the future city. Um, when you see images like these, you, you might notice there's a lot of green. Part of the reason is because there's a thing called urban heat island effect. Although we talk about climate change, global warming, and the world in general is getting warmer, uh, cities themselves, well, uh, they heat up, right? The sun comes on down and hits surfaces, right? If you took all of the pavement in the United States and put it together, it'd be larger than the state of Wisconsin, right? If you could think of a surface that would just absorb as much heat as possible, that would be the black pavement that absorbs that heat. That's why in the summer you're, you're walking, if you're barefoot, like you can hurt your feet, right? Um, well, a lot of places are, are pushing for green roofs. If you've ever heard that term, green roof initiatives, uh, that is trying to change the surfaces up. You see, these are also reflective, right? Rather than traditionally buildings, they didn't really care about what color it was or anything. They didn't really think about the, that that mattered. Uh, but cities in general, especially in the Sun Belt in the US, like if you are living in Arizona and you wanna go into Phoenix to get something and it's the middle of summer, the city is 20 degrees hotter, right? Um, so it costs a ton of money to air condition. Uh, a lot of development has happened in the Sun Belt because people move there because the weather in general is better. Uh, but this heat problem is really been detrimental for people. Uh, so what have people been doing? Trying to integrate more green space in general. I would say the green roofs movement has really taken off in Chicago, uh, but there are plenty of places it hasn't taken off in. Uh, a lot of places in Asia have really done the, the green roofs and trying to increase green spaces. But this is part of the reason why when we talk about infill, right? Well, let's say this area was industrial, right? And it's like, well, that industry faded. Well, what do we do, right? It, well, it depends. Sometimes it's like, well, let's build some housing because we need housing. Uh, sometimes you might just say, let's just turn that into a little green space uh, and just let it be an amenity, right? And so in our downtowns, Minneapolis and St. Paul, there's a surprising amount of green space that was not there before, because uh, it's been converted, right? And well, you pay a price, because if you had a big building here, you'd have a big building of people paying taxes for your local city. So when you decide to have green space like this, you make a sacrifice, but your hope is more people will live here because they want to live next to this green space.
This is another map from basically the end of this chapter, uh, which talks about other other things to focus on uh, as far as, as the future. And you can see a lot of protected wilderness areas. People are hoping a lot of <clears throat> farmland that are relatively close to the cities or that are kind of still in the suburbs. Well, a lot of those uh, you can change back and let it go wild again. And then all of a sudden it's amenity for your place, right? Uh, there's a big push to do more of that kind of thing lately. All right. Oh, and there's a section about Shanghai in this chapter. I was going to show you some pictures of Shanghai, but we're out of time. So today, just sign up for your five points. Make sure your full name is here. People are still putting initials.